Hello, blackguards and blasphemers. My name is TBS Guy, and welcome to a quick look at Blasphemous, a new game from Team 17 and the Game Kitchen. They were nice enough to send along a review code for me so I could take a look at the game a little bit ahead of time, which I'm very grateful for because this game has been on my wish list for a very long time, actually. I, I, the moment I saw this game, I knew whether it was something I'd have to take a look at because, well, because of what you're looking at right now, because of its aesthetic. So... This particular video is going to be focusing on the visuals and the aesthetics and the presentation of the game. We're not going to be focusing on reviewing the gameplay and stuff like that. Other YouTubers are much better at that than I am. What I want to talk about is how this game presents its pixel art aesthetic, what makes it very different from other games in its particular genre, and how it deals with visually portraying spiritual, physical, and emotional suffering. Because this is kind of a rough game. Before we get into anything about this game... This game is brutal um, from its visual and aesthetic standpoint. And if you're used to violent video games and lots of blood spraying everywhere, you know, you might not be touched by that at all. But if you have any kind of a sensitive disposition, if you've ever dealt with spiritual torment, especially if you're a religious person, um, or even if you just dealt with like the issues of depression and self-hate and feelings of being unworthy or unforgiven, this game delves into a lot of that. And personally, I have found that it's kind of hard for me to play this game for long stretches at a time because it just the aesthetic and the visuals and the way it presents itself, it does kind of get into my head and I, I do need to clear my brain every once in a while. So if that sounds like anything that might be liable to, you know, be tough for you to deal with, you might want to watch some more gameplay footage and stuff before you make a purchasing decision. If you're not of a sensitive disposition and you want a 2D Metroidvania action platformer combat Souls-like game, I don't know if there's a more appropriate word for that genre, then this is a really good one. As far as I can tell, anyway, from the four or five hours that I've played so far, this is this is a damn good one. Um, yeah, so let's just get into it. Because it is my guilt, I claim the greatest... My chest hurt with regret. Fought your punishment and nail it deep. Shake my guilt once again. As you can see, the aesthetic here is a mix between realism and a kind of painted unrealism. And I think there's voiceover in a second. And thus, yeah. Guilt, repentance, mourning, and every pain of the soul of all kind were visibly and tangibly manifested everywhere and in all of us. Sometimes in the form of blessing and grace. Sometime in the form of punishment and corruption. That divine will, equally pious and cruel, which we could not and will never be able to unravel, was called the miracle. Welcome to Blasphemous. This is what this game is like. And we'll talk about it a bit more in a second, once we pan down to our protagonist, lying half dead in a sea of bodies. And once again, look at the way the bodies are rendered. Look at the flesh. It's not smooth or stylized or pretty or beautified in any particular way. This is the lumpy unseemly ugly shapes of the human physical form contorted and brutalized and murdered and this game has a lot of that um, which is why I gave a little bit of a content warning up front it also as you may have surmised from the heavy heavy Catholic imagery that you just underwent uh, has some religious undertones going on for it. This game deals heavily with sin and with guilt and with repentance and with the particular Catholic idea of 
spiritual suffering and physical suffering as one thing. Um, and that by physically suffering, you can make up for certain kinds of spiritual suffering. Like these are in some cases fringe beliefs. And the game is very, very careful not to draw any direct lines between it and real life Catholicism. Like it, it obscures it all behind some rather specific metaphors. But it's pretty clear where the visual inspiration is coming from, where the first shot of the game is a person who's nailed not to a cross, but to a stake in a contorted and unnatural position. And we're going to see lots more people who are nailed to stakes uh, before this gameplay is done, <laughs> let me tell you. But I guess the best demonstration of what I mean really comes after, well, what's going to be happening in the room I'm going to be entering in just a minute. Doo -doo -doo. This is a checkpoint, by the way. Uh, this is equivalent to your bonfire in Dark Souls. This is your respawn checkpoint. It refills your health uh, potions. You can see them up there underneath my health bar. And it's your checkpoint that you respawn at if you die, where you can then go and try and reclaim some of what you lose when you die. Because, of course, there's no lives system. Death isn't permanent, but you do lose something every time you die, which we might look at a little bit later. But uh, welcome to the first boss. Warden of the Silent Sorrow. He's an introductory boss, he's not especially hard to kill, and so what I'd like to focus on during the fight with him... Oh, that's a mistake, I'm gonna get hit. Uh, I made it. I do have to focus a little bit, because I can only dash through him at certain intervals. And my dash, of course, is basically the equivalent of your Dark Souls dodge roll. Damn it. Okay, easier just to jump over his attack. What I want you to pay attention to with this guy before he dies, look at the awkwardness of his animation. Look at sort of the, the heavy physicality of his movements. It's not really beautiful in any way, is it? He's this awkward, hunched over, crouched, emaciated human figure floating in the air a little bit there, rendered with a terrible physicality, and when you, they die they don't vanish in a puff of smoke his corpse stays there, because we need it for something We need it for that. So the aesthetic in these cutscenes especially, for me, reminds me a lot of 90s video games. Like, games right back when I started gaming um, for the first time, like games, the cutscenes in games like Wing Commander and stuff like that, where <clears throat> the pixel art animation is a little bit janky and uneven because that was all the computers could handle back then. And the color palette is really limited because that was all computers could even display back then. And that awkwardness, that kind of slightly uncanny valley aesthetic is being employed to great effect in this video game to give the characters a very different sense from, like, pixel art characters can often be highly stylized. In fact, most pixel art games tend to stylize really heavily um, because with pixel art, usually you have a very limited number of pixels to work with, which means you need to communicate as much as possible with as few pixels as possible, which leads to stylization. This game goes the opposite right and says, hey, we have full 1080p resolutions to work with now, so let's try and render this in a sort of awkward, janky pixel art style that is nonetheless scaled up to full uh, resolution, as it were. And it works really well for the game. We'll also see that with this guy. Regretful be the heart, penitent one. The anguish of the eldest brother has now come to an end. I am Deo Gracias, witness to and narrator of the acts of the grievous miracle. Such is my penance, as yours is silence. The cradle of affliction is what you seek. This can be found in the mother of mothers of the churches.
It is a remote place separated from the rest of these lands by a great sacred and forbidden door. Even a wise penitent like me knows nothing of what lies beyond those high walls. However, what I do know is that, according to the rule, one must carry out the three humiliations to gain access to what they guard. One of them must be performed in the high mountains, covered in thick blankets of snow and ice. Another in the depths of a dark, entombed church where the sleeper lies. And the last one, at the end of the trail, carved by moans that claw their way out of an iron spiral. In the bowels of the bell named Hondo that grows into the earth. Take this thorn and place it on the handle of your sword. If, when the time comes, as you grip your weapon firmly, you notice that it wounds you and makes you bleed. Having grown with more thorns sprouting from it, writhing over the figure of the father carved into the knob, that will mean that you are at the mercy of the grievous miracle, whether for its punishment or its forgiveness. Yeah, so if you're wondering about the tall pointed hood, that's actually a thing out of Catholicism. Like, that that's where that particular garment originated and has then, in the years since, been appropriated by different groups who you may have heard of. But, like, so this is not really a reference to any contemporary political movements, but to a long history um, in certain religious circles. Anyway, that guy is tied up with rope. He's tied up in a way that is deeply unpleasant and must be cutting off his circulation as part of his penitence. And that's the, what this game deals with. Humiliations, physical and emotional torment and suffering. You can even see it in the design of the shrine here. These human bodies being made to hold up this effigy to the grace and glory of some presumably rather uncaring god. There is a terrible physicality to the artwork in this game, which is really honestly more, despite being cartoony by the nature of pixel art, to me feels a lot more brutal than it does in a lot of even the sort of the Gears of War, AAA, hyper-brutal titles. And you take a look at the trees here. Take a look at the way that they are rendered. Those trees don't have tree trunks. Those roots continue in an unbroken band all the way up the tree, making these trees appear more like braided ropes, really, than trees as such. And you can kind of see that, that sort of blocky approach to visual aesthetics in the rocks of the cliffs behind us as well, the way that they are painted specifically, which gives them a very, a very sturdy feeling in the way that the artwork is presented, which ties in great... In, in fantastic ways to the aesthetics of the rest of the game. You can really see it in evidence here in this broken down forest with this horse carcass just lying on the ground and these mad cultists trying to kill me. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's parrying in this game. It looks like this. And it's an integral uh, gameplay mechanic. You can't parry everything, but sometimes you can execute enemies in rather gruesome ways. And of course, the more you execute enemies and the more enemies you kill, the more magic power you gather. You can see that up in the blue bar up in the top left, which allows you to perform spells, uh, which are quite useful. Ow. As you shall see in a minute. Rather, but these spells rather are called prayers. Because of course, it's all tied back to the devotion to the grievous miracle. Whatever the heck that means. Which is something that the game explores slowly. Like like the Souls-like games, this game is in absolutely no hurry to reveal itself to you. You figure out what it's about as you go along. But yeah. The aesthetics of this game are largely concerned with physically, visually showing physical brutality. And you can see it in the way that bodies are animated. Um, and in the way that the bodies of enemies are rendered. Like, look at that guy. 
when he swings, you can see all the muscle and all the flesh of his body in a in a rather explicitly rendered way. And it's not that brutal yet, but some of the enemies that you come up on later... ...really work with the idea of visual and physical suffering. By the way, the thing that these guys are carrying, they look like wagon wheels, but they're not. Well, they are, but they also aren't. These are braking wheels. They are medieval torture devices. Um, its victims would be tied to the wheels and then tormented in various ways, often being pulled apart by the limbs and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that in there. There's a lot of, of enemies and characters in this game which carry around the tools of their own torture. I don't know what that means yet. I haven't gotten far enough into the game. But that's what I mean when I say that this game is largely concerned with establishing a visual union between physical suffering and spiritual suffering and suffering of the soul. Um, and it does this through imagery that's heavily appropriated from um, Catholicism. Now, there's a lot more you can explore in this village, by the way. This village is kind of a hub area from which you can explore the rest of the world, but I have stuff to show you, so we're moving on a little bit more quickly. And here again, look at the background. This is one of the things I love about the aesthetic design of this particular video game. See how every single building, like there's practically no straight lines anywhere. Everything is kind of askew and a little bit offset from one another or kind of crumbling or sinking into each other. And the sense of scale is the really clever thing, because, like, look at that thing here. That looks like a gate, right, that a person should be able to walk through. It looks like it should be at a human scale, but it's taller than a house. And, like, the house here in the background, and that gravestone, which goes up almost to the tree line of that tree. And that's something that this game plays with a hell of a lot. Sense of scale is completely distorted. As we saw when we opened the game, we saw that guy tied to a stake in the background. He was either a monumental giant or a statue or something, and we saw that with um, uh, the hooded guy we encountered after the boss fight, who was so much larger than me, for no apparent reason, like, he didn't seem to be a different species, and, uh, yeah, here's, you have one of the enemies I was talking about, this lady here, she's tied with ropes in a very uncomfortable way to that statue of what looks like a saint, she's bleeding, and she's naked, and she's trying to kill you. There's a union here between physical suffering and spiritual repentance, which is why we doused ourselves with blood. It was a humiliation of ourselves in order to earn redemption in the eyes of whatever divinity it is that rules this particular world. By the way, the people tied to the stakes here in the background, yeah, they're alive. Unless you decide to, well, put them out of their misery. Watch how this lady dies. <laughs> Crushed to death by the weight of her own spiritual grief. Like, that's that's the imagery that's being employed here is... When enemies die, a lot of the time, especially the ones that are carrying around, like, statues or... Um, the doors of tombs and stuff like that, as we shall see as we head into some buildings a little bit further on in here. They are often undone, much like um, the guys with the wheels that were trying to hit me. When they die, they're crushed by their own wheels. Like, they, they land on top of them and, and squash them flat. And it's the same thing with these people up here, who uh, are carrying around. You can see this icon of a saint or something as a shield in front of them, so I can't really attack them so easily. You have to parry these guys. There we go. Crushed again by the weight of, you know, the divinity. Crushed by the weight of the symbol of divinity that they're carrying around. And they're also just gorgeously animated. Like, there's a lot of frames of animation in the animation of these enemies. Which is important because there's a physicality to them. There's a, a really potent physicality. You can see these guys are not carrying these things around easily. They are lumbering under the weight of these things. They are not, like, s sliding along and doing kung fu moves with them. They're sort of dragging them across the ground as they mind sort of single-mindedly pursue you in order to inflict their pain on you. And this is just all over the aesthetics of this particular game. Ow. Ow. 
enemies that you can see it with these guys as well, who seem to have had their lower jaws and most of their faces torn off and who explode in a shower of guts when they die. This is a world that's sort of just dragging itself through almost indescribable pain in order to visit that pain upon others. And as far as I can tell, all of this is intentional. It's not just that they're designing enemies to look kind of gruesome and frightening. It's that these enemies are designed to tell some of the story of the game. Some of the story of what it's like to live in this particular world. And it's not a happy story. And that's something that's kind of rare. Like, I, I, I half-jokingly refer to this as 2D pixel art, Souls-like, Metroidvania... Um, oh, shit. <laughs> I died. <laughs> I didn't grab the ladder. 2D Souls-like action platformer fighting game Metroidvania. Um, because it's, it's a genre that's kind of still developing and doesn't really have a name, but something that's very rare in games like that is... This sense of heavy physicality um, that especially the enemies have, like the penitent one, because you have to be somewhat agile in order to play the game efficiently, isn't rendered that way, except in the cutscenes where you can see the physicality of this character, like this heaviness with which they move. They don't move swiftly or elegantly. Yeah, lots of blood in this game. Blood is also employed visually as a... Um, the sword, by the way, is called the mea culpa, which means uh, my fault or my guilt, I think, something along those lines. Blood is employed a lot in this game. There's a lot of blood everywhere. Um, as a visual signifier in the same way that the blood of the martyred saints often is in Catholicism. As you can see here in the background, these people are called wound kissers. And they try to heal uh, those who are suffering by literally kissing their wounds. You can see the old man doing it here in the background. And you can see the guy here trying to kiss the chest wound of this infected person. And there's a very, very physical relationship with pain here. A very... A very close relationship with pain. There's no distance. And that's what you get in Spectacle Fighters. And even games like Dark Souls tend to make you distant from the pain of what's actually happening. By... Um... Like, when enemies die in Dark Souls, for example, they just vanish in a cloud of smoke and you gain their souls. Like, the uh, uh, Right? They don't generally lie around like corpses or explode in a shower of blood and guts and gore. They kind of just vanish from the world once you defeat them. Which, as we saw with the first boss in the game, doesn't really happen here. And that's kind of what fascinates, because we don't see like this unflinching and very brutal relationship with physical suffering and pain and torment and grief. Like, there's a lot of feeling of grief in this game. Grief about a broken world. Grief about being abandoned uh, by God as it were. Grief about being alone with your suffering. Grief about never being forgiven for the things that you've done. Which is rare. Like, those are really heavy, difficult emotions to deal with, and, and like, difficult topics to tackle. Even in, like, giant, big-budget AAA video games don't often do a very good job of it. So I'm really fascinated by this game that it's willing to tackle shit like that, really heavy shit like that. Um, that you know, would be very difficult to get most other publishers to sign off on. And also, there's a lot of aesthetic variety uh, in this game, despite it, it might not seem it like when you were walking around the overworld, mostly you're just dealing with dilapidated buildings and, you know, bare rock and barely any vegetation. And uh, here again, uh, poor souls made to suffer. There's a lot of that. Hello. Notice this guy when he throws? 
He's bleeding from his back. This guy is a bull. And what he's throwing at you is bullfighter spears. The spears that matadors stick into the backs of bulls when they fight them. He's been stuck with those spears as well. And now he's throwing them at you. That's in here a lot. People passing their pain and suffering on to others. Or trying to make other people responsible for their misery in some way or another. You saw it with what the statue that I gave my sword to told me. That you know, by lending me the pain of my grief and guilt, somehow that would help them deal with their suffering. Like, that seems to be a theme going on in here. Like, the sharing of pain and suffering and misery. I'm just gonna put these poor souls out of it. Ugh. And that's really what... Yeah, like I said, that's what's been fascinating to me about this game. That it, it, it dares to deal with this kind of subject matter, which is not only taboo, but kind in some ways kind of dangerous to deal with. Had not met him before. That's a new one. But again, see the bleeding. Oh boy. Ow. That's not great. Oh, he knocked me off the wall. <laughs> There's a lot of masks in this game as well, as you may have noticed. A lot of, of um, putting on the face of someone else, as it were. Which I'm curious about as an aesthetic choice. Wait. Get away from the spikes. What that might signify and indicate. Like, this is a game that I think is very, very rich um, for analysis. And for contemplation and discussion of what exactly its aesthetics communicate. And I'd be curious to see someone else do that. I don't think I have the mental fortitude for it, to be honest. Oh, that guy's cut in half, isn't he? This is an area I haven't explored in my own playthrough yet, so I'm, I'm just... I'm being a little bit curious while we're going through here. This feels like... Yep. Hello. Yeah, it felt like something like that would happen. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was a quick look at uh, Blasphemous. When you die, you lose some of your magic meter. Up here on the left, you can see some of it is sealed off with thorns right now because I died too much. Uh, you can go and reclaim those parts of your magic power that you've lost. I believe it's hanging around around where you died. And that's how you get that back. Anyway, this is a heavy game. Like I said... I think it's a game that should be played and discussed and thought about and analyzed, but I'm not sure I can recommend it to anyone because it is a little bit rough on the soul. Like, if you empathize with any of what happens in this video game, any of the, that visual imagery, any of that idea of self-punishment or suffering in grief, it can be a bit of a rough game, but God damn it, it's interesting. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this quick look, well, feel free to hit the like button, the comment button, the subscribe button down below and do all of those things that allow a YouTube channel like mine to survive in the long run. Um, you can also support the channel more directly on Patreon if you are so inclined. And I do have some tip jars down below if you don't want to sign up for a monthly subscription thing. And as I say at the end of my videos, even a dollar or two to a content creator like me can be the same as thousands of views on a video or tens of thousands of views on web pages that are supported by advertising. So even though they don't feel like very much, those small donations, that little bit of help, that actually makes kind of a big difference for online content creators. So whether it's me or someone else, 
If there's an online content creator whose work you enjoy, please consider supporting them directly when you can, because even small amounts matter a lot more than you think. If you haven't enjoyed this video, well, I can't say I blame you, because I'm not sure I enjoyed making it in the traditional sense. I'm fascinated by this game, but I can't say I'm having fun when I play it exactly. So if you feel the same way, I wouldn't blame you if you feel the need to hit the dislike button. Thank you very much for watching.